Hello, welcome to Modern Day Debate. Today we are discussing the ethics of abortion and we are starting now. Modern Day Debates. I'm Carissa and I'm going to be your host for tonight. We are a nonpartisan channel that hosts debates on science, religion, and politics. And our purpose is to give everyone their fair shot to make their case on an equal playing field. In fact, if you love debates and this is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we have many debates to come. Um, for tonight's debate, the format is going to be as follows. We're going to have roughly 10 minute openings followed by 50 to 60 minutes of open discussion um, and roughly 30 minutes of question and answer. So if you have a question, feel free to fire it into the chat. Make sure to tag us at Modern Day Debate and Super Chats are also an option. Um, but they will go to the top of the list and be first priority. Um, also for tonight, we've put all the links of the speakers into the description box below. So if you really like the speakers, um, you can just go down there and find uh, more of that content. If, if you actually, um, we actually really, we appreciate all of our guests being here. Um, and we are going to uh, just do a quick little introduction. Um, we'll start off with uh, nine, nine inch, nine, uh, let's see, let's start off with Kay. Um, <laughs> Kay, what are you gonna, what would they find by clicking <laughs> your link in the description? Um, so, uh, I'm probably most active, um, on Twitter. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. I haven't been super great about uploading to it, but you can definitely find me on YouTube at Kay Fellows, and I'm actually on that tag, um, on all social media platforms. Perfect. Wonderful. And then next, how about Nine Tails? What would they find by clicking your link? Well, I'm Nine Tails. Uh, basically, I'm hoping to be a video creator. So if you go to my YouTube channel, for now, you'll see some debates and the little tiny thing. But soon, I'll be doing some video essays, some cute little funny things. So keep an eye out for that. Awesome. Perfect. Um, how about you, Kelsey? What will they find by clicking your link? Hi, everybody. My name is Kelsey Hazard, and I'm the founder and president of Good Pro Life. As that name suggests, we take a religiously neutral abortion. We see it as a life in. You know what? We are going to come back to you. Oh, we are both I'm sorry for interrupting you. We're going to come back to you. Um, it's cutting out just a little bit. Um, so hopefully it'll get back on. Uh, we're gonna go to Hannah. Go ahead, Hannah, what, what will they find at your link? And then we'll come right back to Kelsey. Sure, it links to my YouTube channel. I'm a leftist streamer. I do stuff on Twitch. I cover uh, politics. I cover crazy stuff like debunking conspiracy theories. Um, I talk about religion, all sorts of stuff. It's lots of fun, go check it out. Uh, perfect. And Kelsey, I, hopefully it's squared away. Um, yeah, wow. I, I am terribly, terribly sorry for the connectivity issues. Oh, you know, I, I turned off my video in an attempt to resolve that, but it seems we're still having problems. So hopefully mm -hmm. we can get through this. Uh, I'm not sure what the last one was you heard me say, but you can follow Secular Pro Life on Facebook. There's about 32,000 of us there, uh, and we welcome people of every faith and none. So I encourage you to check that out. Wonderful. All right. So first off, we are going to start with the affirmative opening speeches. Um, go ahead. Either Hannah or or um, Nine Tails. Okay. Either, either yeah. one. I'll go first. Hello. First, I would like to thank Hannah for doing this debate for me. Thank you to my opponents, Kate and Kelsey, for coming. Thank you to James for putting this together and Carissa for moderating. Today, I would simply like to put forth my argument by pointing out that one cannot truly have libertarian views and be against abortion. One de definition of libertarianism might be that they 
paradoxically believe that order can be achieved by limiting how government intervenes with things. I'm not here to attack that, but rather to put into question where that belief stems from. For most, it is probably a belief that a freer world is better. Except I believe that too, and that's why I'm exclusively pro-choice. This is because the alternative to abortion is a forced pregnancy for those who carry children. I would like to ask my opponents to explain the ethics of forcing someone to carry a child, not just disprove that abortion is ethical, which in my opinion is difficult to do anyways. I can personally think of 25 different reasons a pregnancy can be unwanted by the childbearer, and those reasons can be divided into four or five subcategories depending on taste. Yet all of those reasons center around socioeconomic factors for the most part. Why? Because having a child is a commitment and thus the longevity of the family is key. Assuming, here is, assuming everyone here is against slavery, I'd like to posit something interesting. Is a better world for a child born into existence not a better world for us all? Is the, is the best thing not to limit the conditions a child can be born into to the least off, to, uh, to the best ones possible for everyone? I would like, and I'm just gonna kind of break away from my script and point out that we all kind of would like to have the most preferable childhood. That That's just everything we all want anyways. Um, I would argue the only people who this is not a concern for are those not born into things like poverty, unmature parenting, or abusive relationships, for example. With society being as complex as ever, I find it personally sad that we so easily dismiss these things as, in as insignificant to favor over a mindless right to life. Having nuance and grace can only help here. And by acknowledging that no system or culture is diverse and con conscientious enough to not force a child to be born into unideal conditions, then it should be up to the person, uh, then it shows how it should be up to the person carrying the child. I'd also like to comment on the idea that a baby born can only be a good thing. It's not. It's only good inherently if the pregnancy was wanted. When the pregnancy becomes unwanted, the relationship is no longer mutualistic and the negative factors inherently outweigh the good of procreation because the fetus is now classifiable simply as a hollow beyond and the relationship is more parasitic uh, in favor of the fetus. The fetus, by chance, is the only li living organisms we've ever assigned personhood to, despite it not having its own independent biome. That's kind of, that's kind of weird. Uh, personhood is best described as a spectrum of qualifying features attributing to optimal personhood, which, most which is most attributed to mature adulthood. By favoring the fetus's right to life, we are forgetting that we are forgetting how we are prioritizing the right of autonomy to much more established persons who already have had more worth to society. It's not a big deal that a supposed life won't get to fulfill its destiny. It was never reserved for them anyways. I hope in this debate I can show abortion is better for a freer world and that abortion can only be ethical with things being so complex. If you believe that freedom and agency should define how we live, then acknowledge abortion as ethical only makes sense in this regard and the right of the mother to her agency and autonomy is only better for everybody. And that is my time. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Hannah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so morality is a complicated issue and it's something that as humans we struggle with every day. There are a lot of gray areas that aren't necessarily black and white and well, it can be complicated. I believe there are certain moral truisms and understandings that can be found common amongst all people when you put things up against like thought experiments. Like for instance, um, if you're a firefighter and you happen to find a fertility clinic burning down and you go inside and you find a five-year-old little girl there and next to her you have a tank full of embryos ready for implantation, hundreds of them. If you're going to decide that an embryo is tantamount morally to a human life, then clearly the answer should be, okay, I'm going to save the tank first because it includes hundreds and hundreds of potential human life. But I would think that the majority of people put in this situation would probably choose to save the little girl instead. I think this speaks to the issue that most people understand 
if not intrinsically, at least at some level, that there is a moral difference between the personhood of a living, breathing human being with not only sentience and but sapience and a potential human being, for whatever that might mean. So if we're talking about the personhood of someone in the first place, I've noticed a lot of uh, anti-choice people tend to choose what seem to be somewhat arbitrary points. I don't know if the people here are going to discuss any of these, but things like heartbeats, things like uh, nerve development, things like that. And I think it muddies the issue and tries to make it one of science when really we're probably mostly talking about philosophical issues. Even the personhood argument aside, even if one were to agree that fetuses have the same moral right as a human being, no human being can force another person to give up their bodily autonomy in order to save their life. Imagine if you're in a car accident. Imagine it's even a car accident that you caused due to negligence. And the car accident damages someone's kidney. They go into renal failure. The cops cannot force you to give your kidney to that person because it is your fault that they have come under harm. Our bodily autonomy is something that as a society we respect in the highest regard. It's something that we all intrinsically understand. No one should be forced to change the material conditions of their body for the worse or even just for inconvenience sake, just for someone else whether that's a fully grown adult or a fetus. So I think these issues are complicated and I by no means believe that my answer to this question is the definitive answer, but I'm fortunate enough that we live in a country where my opinion doesn't have to be the only opinion. If someone in this country believes that a fetus is a person, that's their right, that's fine. I don't think it's a moral black and white area and if that's where they find themselves on that issue, that's great. But by the same token, they can't force that belief on other people. There are things that we all agree as a society are evil. Murder. But murder involves a victim that is a human being. And a fetus, philosophically speaking, there's no definitive answer. So I'm looking forward to having a discussion on this um, and seeing where you guys fall on this. So uh, thank you. All right, perfect. Um, before we hand it over to um, either Kelsey or Kay, whoever wants to go first, um, I would like to remind the chat and those who are commenting, um, who are watching it later, to keep um, attacks on the ideological level, not on the personal level. Let's keep everything um, polite and kind in the chat. Attack the ideas, not the person. All right, go ahead, either Kelsey or Kay, go for it. Uh, I, I think I'll take it just in case my connection cuts out again. I don't know what is happening, and I did miss a little bit of what Hannah said, but uh, thank you all uh, for being here. This is my second time on Modern Day Debate, and I appreciate you having me back. I'm always happy to be part of a discussion that keeps religion out of it, and in my view, that's how public policy debates should be. Uh, I did see somebody on Twitter was bringing up the Bible before we even got started, but I am an atheist, so I will not be going down that particular rabbit hole. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, obviously, the debate of right to life versus bodily autonomy is an important one, and we are going to have it. Uh, but before we do, I think it's important to acknowledge that this debate is miles removed from lived experience. People don't get abortions because they feel they've been invaded by an alien parasite and they must vindicate the integrity of their uterus. Like, that's obviously rhetoric and that's not how normal people talk. And as for me, I will readily concede that the average abortion does not begin with somebody waking up and saying, you know, I think I'll dismember my unborn son or daughter today just to show how much I hate human rights. Uh, we know why people seek abortions. That research has been done. It's because the bills are piling up. It's because the college campus doesn't have daycare. It's because the last time somebody at the company had a baby, the boss found a pretext to fire her. It's because frequently their partners suck and aren't stepping up to the plate. It's because they're scared. And these are people who, if the timeline were shifted just a few months into the future, would never dream of solving those problems with violence, would never commit infanticide to promote her agency or the well-being of her family. 
But in our culture, because law teaches, abortion is considered an acceptable solution or even the obvious solution. And that means choosing life can mean swimming upstream. I firmly believe that if we can address those root causes, if we can stop the abortion choices that aren't actually free choices, there wouldn't, wouldn't be enough left to keep the abortion centers profitable and in business. Uh, and everybody has a role to play. In my case, I happen to have a guest bedroom, so my primary contribution is housing. Uh, but if you can't open up your home, you can volunteer or donate money or pro promote pregnancy resources on social media or any, any number of other things uh, to suit your abilities. And pro-lifers are making strides in this area, but we can't do it alone. Uh, we are obviously going to have strong disagreements tonight, but if you're willing to help tackle the root causes, you are not my enemy. And I, I wouldn't consider any of you my enemies anyway. We were having a lovely talk before the stream even began. So I'm very pleased to be here with all of you wonderful people. Uh, that said, I do take a stance firmly in favor of the humanity of the unborn child. And I think basing personhood on someone's worth to society is extremely dangerous. Over the years, I've heard a lot of criteria proposed uh, for why those in the womb should not be considered part of humanity. Um, and invariably, I have found that those criteria, if applied consistently, would also wind up excluding some population of born humans. Uh, most often, newborns, infants, and people with serious disabilities. Uh, I don't deny that bodily autonomy is a value. Uh, certainly in cases where it doesn't hurt anybody else, bodily autonomy is a no-brainer. You know, get that tattoo, smoke that joint, I don't care. Uh, but there are situations, and you know, Hannah, you were talking about thought experiments. I don't think we actually need to resort to thought experiments because there is a real world scenario that comes pretty close to being analogous to pregnancy. Uh, and that's the situation of conjoined twins. Uh, when twins are conjoined, first of all, it is nobody's fault, uh, which is important because I, I definitely don't belong to the she should have kept her leg clo legs closed uh, school of thought. Uh, pregnancy, pregnancy conjoined twins, nobody's fault. Uh, but it is nevertheless the case that in um, most conjoined twins, one twin is stronger than the other, and the weaker is dependent, physically dependent, upon the stronger twin. Uh, you know, doctors approach conjoined twins by trying to figure out in those particular medical circumstances whether the odds of survival are better with separation surgery or without, and they proceed accordingly, which I think is a pretty pro-life way to go about things. Uh, but the way we don't go about things is we don't say that the stronger twin can unilaterally declare, I'm getting the separation, my body, my choice, even if that means the twin is going to die. That's not how we go about that. And so I don't think that that is how we should go about abortion either. All right. That's wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead, um, Kay, if you want to do the last opening. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. Kay, are you there? I can hear you. I think there might be a little bit of a lag. That's what I'm expecting. Mm. Um, so I think just in maybe a, a few seconds. And then she's going to talk over me. I, oh, I like sure. it. I'll try to keep mine as brief as possible so that we can get into more of a conversation instead of just talking at each other. Um, I'm not just a pro-life activist. Um, I'm what they call a consistent life ethic activist. We can hear you. <laughs> In an unexpected twist, yeah. Kay is the one. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. Are we good? Now I hear you.
I think we might have lost Kelsey again. No, I'm here. Now I can't hear you, Carissa. All right, sorry, I was muted. If you can hear this, just keep on talking over me, Kate. The lag is just catching up. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Oh no. All <laughs> right, so I think Hello. she'll be logging in here. I think she realized there was a lag, so she's just gonna come right back. Um, in well, the meantime, yeah. one thing. I, I actually am now in the middle of a horrible thunderstorm, so it won't shock me if I get kicked off too. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> this could end up being pretty short. Congratulations, everyone. What a fantastic thing. <laughs> well, in oh. the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about some things. I've also heard James talk about um, some housekeeping things. Um, we are um, looking for some chat moderators that are a little bit on the further right side. We have a lot of lefty chat chat um, moderators. So if you are a further right person who would be um, happy to be a chat moderator, please hit uh, modern day debate up and we can definitely talk. Um, all right, perfect. Kay is back. You can go ahead for your opening statement. <laughs> All right, I will try to be as brief as possible so that we can get into the conversation. Um, I am not just a pro-life activist. I'm what they call a consistent life ethic activist, which means I don't support any type of violence from one human being to the other. And it's not just inclusive of abortion. I think that of all of the horrible tr human rights violations that we see currently in our culture today, that abortion is probably one of the worst that I have ever seen. And just simply because um, believing in the humanity of a preborn human means that I see them as the most vulnerable, innocent, and defenseless of our species. Uh, they have no ability to speak for themselves. They have no ability to defend themselves. And that's why I became a pro-life activist in the first place. Um, after seeing the humanity of preborn humans uh, throughout my mom's pregnancies, I'm one of, I have 16 siblings altogether. I have seen many humans grow and develop. Um, I've seen them unfortunately pass away before reaching uh, the moment of birth. And I can speak very, very clearly to the humanity of a preborn human, even at the earliest stages of pregnancy. Um, so that's why I became a pro-life activist to begin with, because I see these humans as the most innocent and the most defenseless and the most in need of grown adult human people that are living, breathing, walking around to come forward and be the voice that they don't have and defend their rights to their own life um, from the beginning of life, which I believe is conception. Um, I don't believe in these kind of arbitrary uh, different stages of life that were, that even the pro-life movement puts out, you know, he, the fetus has a heartbeat, the fetus has, you know, brain development, the fetus has this, the fetus has that, you know, 20 weeks and it's, it's wrong after 20 weeks. I don't, I am consistent life, pro-life, for the whole life conception to natural death. Um, I don't support any type of violence, even to born adult human beings living, walking, breathing. I'm anti-war, I'm anti-death penalty. Um, but I do believe that there is a very real conversation to be had about how we go about as a society, making a society, our society and our culture more accepting to these women that are in these crisis pregnancies. Um, I'm not just a consistent life ethic activist. I also label myself a feminist. Um, I see the horrible things that these women are facing, these very, very harsh environments, the horrifying fear of unplanned pregnancy. I have gone through it myself and I know how terrifying it can be. And I can only imagine what some of these women go through that are in worse situations than I was. And so I do believe that there is a conversation to be had 
about what we can do as a culture and as a society and as individual human beings about what we can do to help these women and these girls that are in these situations to make it so that they don't feel the need to go and get abortions. Um, but I don't think I take a firm stance against using violence against any other human being in order to relegate my circumstances or anybody else's circumstances, whether that be fear or whether it be any other type of hardship. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kay. Um, so we'll go ahead into the open discussion. Okay, uh, could I just ask my opponents, uh, you're probably both against forced servitude, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay, um, so do you think that forced servitude for the person bearing the child is either a-okay or that it's unequivocal in this case? I think it's, I, I mean, Kay, you're a, you're a mother, so you can probably speak to this better than, than I can, but I, I think it's a little insulting to compare parenthood to slavery. Well, what's the alternative to not allowing them to have the abortion? It's you're basically telling them they have to to dedicate their life to this child, to this uh, unborn being. I don't I don't think that's accurate. I mean, we we have adoption in this country. We have safe haven laws in this country where you can place a baby at a hospital with absolutely no questions asked. So what we're really so talking about is you know you're, now now you're treating merely the the state of being pregnant as if it were toiling in a cotton field. Well, it probably would feel like that for somebody who doesn't want the abortion. So even if we have those adoptions and stuff, how do, how do you account for those nine months? I also wanted to bring up, I know you mentioned that like the way that abortion is depicted uh, in media sometimes isn't exactly accurate. And you mentioned something along the lines of people don't wake up and think, oh, there's this like, parasite monster inside me and stuff but like i've i've talked to women um my girlfriend also in particular like she is horrified at the concept of becoming pregnant whereas this isn't the case for most women necessarily there are plenty of women out there who do take the concept of becoming pregnant going through nine months of pregnancy and all the bodily changes and view that as like horrific so that is a factor here that there are people who no, do not choose to have abortions necessarily for socioeconomic factors, although many of them do, but for the reason that they just don't want kids and don't want that to happen to their body. And I do think that, that is something that comes in when we're talking about like the autonomy argument. So the the scenarios I was discussing, I'm, I'm basing that on research from the Guttmacher Institute, uh, which is a pro-choice source and would have all the incentive in the world to highlight people who are getting abortions because of, of fears about changes. And statistically, it's just not there. There's, you know, people, Kay, Kay and I am not, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Okay, so I think that what Kelsey was referring to is um, a study done by the Guttmacher Institute, which is a pro choice. Um, outlet. So uh, they're, they're kind of biased in uh, pro-abortion leaning. And uh, they have released studies that state that the majority of abortions are done for, you know, the, all kinds of reasons regarding uh, socioeconomic issues um, and fear of things like being, uh, being kicked out of their current living situation, uh, school, not being able to afford a child, so on and so forth. I think that's what she was getting at before she got cut off. Is okay. she dead? And I, I, I'm I, I, here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. <laughs> All right, this is so strange. All right, keep, keep going with Abby. I'm sorry. <laughs> So I understand like the socioeconomic argument and saying that we should fix those issues, but isn't it seem like you should fix those issues before you start tackling, trying to make it so people can't have abortions if they want? Because if you try and get that done first, then they're still facing the same socioeconomic issues that you're discussing. Like you haven't solved that issue first. And it seems to me that it would even make sense to say, why don't we just focus on those issues? And abortion can still be something that someone can choose for themselves if that's something they want. But by fixing these social and economic factors, it will reduce abortions overall. 
and then it'll only leave the kind of people who just don't want kids for a variety of factors or don't want to go through a pregnancy. So there's uh, an amazing kind of like turn happening um, in the pro-life movement that's been happening over the last several years to where there is a much broader focus on the social issues and kind of changing society to be more pro-life and be more supportive of women in unplanned pregnancies. Um, we do have plenty of people that are working on a legal level, but you have, we literally have thousands of activists and dozens of organizations that their primary focus is getting these women the resources and the help that they need. So if they don't want to have an abortion and we do see that there is an overwhelming amount of women that have stated that they wouldn't have an abortion if they weren't in the situation that they're in. Getting these women the, so the resources that they need, the assistance that they need, not just throughout their pregnancy, but after birth and throughout childhood, we help parents that, you know, not even are expecting that already have kids and are just in need. Um, we are seeing more of a focus, more of a shift towards that. Um, I do believe that we are capable of doing both at the same time, kind of tackling it on a legal level while also making it a very, very strict focus on doing the groundwork um, in our society and in our culture, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, uh, to make sure that these women have the resources that they need um, in order to not feel it necessary to even go through with an abortion. Yeah, I, I, I just sorry, like I just want to add to that, you know, I, I, I agree with the, the idea that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I also think we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, to, to your question of what comes first, I think they have to be joint because particularly when, you, um, and, and, and I'm not going to be able to summarize decades of pro-life feminist scholarship in, in such a short time frame, but the, the basic idea is that abortion is acting as a band-aid or a safety valve that actually prevents substantial progress on those root causes, right? So to take an example, you see, for instance, um, corporations coming out and saying, oh my gosh, Georgia is considering, considering an abortion ban. We're going to boycott the state of Georgia if this goes through. Okay. What, what are the, what are the, pater do you have paid parental leave at those corporations? No. You see what they're doing? They're relying on the availability of legal abortion as an excuse not to tackle the underlying root causes. The idea, the, the it, it, it is happening, especially from from these kind of corporate forces. You know, the it, it started as being a woman's choice, but now it's a woman's problem. So I think you're confusing the order in which responsibility onto her. I think you're really confusing the order in which ways things are happening. Um, typically speaking, women weren't even in the workforce to begin with. So the fact that like paid leave came about was after decades of fighting. And I doubt that you would see less fighting for that simply because abortion was around. I mean, we, so, so we in the United States don't have paid parental leave. I, I'm not, I mean, individual and companies we, may we do pay in, for but we do in Canada, we have abortion. So I just don't understand how you can claim that paid parental leave is only happening because abortion or not happening because of abortion, my bad. I'm saying, I, okay, we, we've got, may, maybe what I'm talking about is specific to the United States. Though. Well, it just doesn't but, logically but it, track, it's to be honest. definitely a pattern that we're seeing. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the U.S. has some of the worst parental leave laws in the entire world. Um, but I think what Kelsey is more referencing, like paid leave is just skimming the surface of what these issues are. What, like, oh, sure. If you look back like throughout history, you know, you have like our typical stereotype of like the 1950s housewife. And then in the 60s, you saw what we call the sexual revolution. Whenever feminism became, we had a new wave of feminism. This is whenever conversations about abortion becoming legal on a national level started happening. It's because women were fed up with being shoved into a box and told that they needed to stay home and be in the kitchen and just serve their husbands. And they had every right to be irritated. They were being taken for granted. They weren't given equal representation. Yeah, we had won the right to vote, but we were still being treated as second class citizens. We weren't expected okay. to go into the workforce. Could I just and ask you a quick question based on that though? 
if you think that it's a victory that women don't have to stay home and, and, and stuff like this, how is it suddenly good simply because we're saving a single life that we throw away these lives all the time. So it's not really that like inherently moral to, to save these lives. How is it good to suddenly force that woman or that person carrying the child, I should say, to stay home for nine months? Well, having gone through two pregnancies, I think that the majority of, unless you're doing manual labor and even throughout the first several months of pregnancy until you get into the later third trimester, you can still go to your job and do your job. I don't believe that women- Okay, sorry. Whatever, whatever amount of time you can't do it for, but how do you justify that simply for a life that nature throws out all the time? Um, well- Go ahead. Go ahead, Kay. Go ahead, Kofi. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, my, my question is going to end up, end up taking us down another path, but I, I, I just have never understood this argument from miscarriage. You know, the, the idea that because natural deaths occur, that intentional deaths should also be fine. Like I, I, well, it I, points I, out I, that. I mean, that, that seems to me like it would justify yeah. killing people over 90. I think part and of it makes comes from a place of it seems hypocritical because when people say things like, oh, life begins at conception and that's just a black and white fact, people don't treat like spontaneous miscarriages in the first eight weeks like a baby dying most of the time. They don't. In, the pro-life, in pro-life circles, they actually do. Uh, it depends like, on the person. I've, but like, I've no. never lost a born child. Like Both of my children are thankfully still alive and healthy and I you know, pray that I never have to experience that. But I did go through a miscarriage at about five or six weeks. And it it was, it was very emotionally traumatizing. And I think that another issue that stems but from just point out is that, that we take ca- humanity away from people that have suffered miscarriage. You know, they, they're they losing, they're losing a life. They are. And it Can is. Can I just point like, out very, though, yeah. that your account for miscarriage being bad because of your anecdotal evidence, it doesn't actually account for women who don't want the pregnancy, so their miscarriage is a good thing. So the fact that the miscarriage can be bad doesn't make it inherently bad. I would also say that even if as an individual you personally felt a great loss, and I have a lot of sympathy for you there, I'm sorry, but society as a whole does not consider it the same as a child dying. For instance, if we did and we thought that someone losing a child in the first six weeks or so was tantamount to a child dying, then we would have manslaughter investigations every time it happens. Like, it's just, it's it's a natural fact of life, and it's a very sad fact of life, but it is one nonetheless. I mean, natural deaths normally aren't investigated as manslaughter. This is another one of those concepts that I've heard before that, I, that I'm just very puzzled by. I mean, na- natural, if, if there's no reason to find a death suspicious, it's typically not investigated. And I really don't see what any of that has to do with whether somebody's a person or not. Well, what's, what's the smallest coffin you've ever seen? Because I've actually never personally seen one small enough to put an unborn fetus into. I'm going to say yikes on that one. That, I, I'm just saying we don't, we don't work. We don't honor them like the dead typically. There, there, so, there, there are, 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 are no, I, I can acknowledge people do it. Yeah. Just one, one moment. Let's let's let Nine Tails finish their point, and then um, Kelsey, you can go ahead and respond. Like the way we value life is clearly not just this thing where we suddenly say, "Okay, this thing's a living being. We have to we have to honor it." Now we say, "Okay, this person was born into the world. Now we'll honor their death." But I, I don't think that just because a small subsect of people do it out of dogmatic reasons that that's proof that their life is inherently valuable. And I think that now we're in a, at a point where the argument is circular that we don't value unborn lives because we don't value unborn lives as a society. So that that's not persuasive. Because me. there's nothing and to I value. Like, you know, to play devil's advocate, you know, we keep saying, you know, we don't do, you know, we don't see pre-born humans the same as we see in born humans. We don't feel their deaths the same way that we feel the deaths of born humans. We don't have uh, a certain amount of, the same amount of empathy for pre-born human lives. Well, the same argument can be made for people that support war. You know, you don't Mm. see people that support war. They're not, they're not shedding any tears over the innocents that are bombed, you know, overseas because they have no empathy for that life. This is why I personally am a consistent life ethic activist. I am zero tolerance for any violence between two or more humans. 
tip at each other because valuing human life cannot have exceptions. Well, here's where I ask. Valuable or it's not. Well, here's where I ask that you start being empathetic for the mother as well, because I think that she is the best person to determine the value of that life. It's going to have to be valuable for her, for her to want to be a mother to it. Uh, I'm using gendered language. I'm really sorry for anybody who that affects, by the way. Um, and so I, I really do think that you're just arbitrarily prioritizing a life over another for the simple dogmatic reason that you think one's more empathetic than the other. See, here, here's the issue I have with that. I mean, you, you have spoken earlier in this debate about, you know, the idea that you're, that, that you're being forced into, or someone is being forced into raising a child for 18 well, years and that sort of just, thing. Just, just, so, just so, so I can, can I, can I just be super clear? If somebody oh, just, doesn't want the pregnancy. One second. Just, let's just, people are let's, talking over one another. I, let's let Kelsey finish. And then if there's any clarity. Just to make sure. Okay. Okay. Fine. All right, all right, all right. Now, now I'm starting to lose my train of thought. That I really don't appreciate the interruptions. Uh, yeah, if 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 your argument is the person who is raising the child is most affected, and therefore it should be that person's choice, then birth is an extremely arbitrary marker because babies actually are a lot more work outside the womb. And you you discounted the adoption idea earlier. So what you are arguing does seem to allow for for death quite a bit later than birth. So do women have the choice to flick a switch and just uh, have the fetus grow outside of their bodies? Okay, so now you're making a totally different argument about- No, I'm not. I'm, I'm saying that women do not have the choice to not be pregnant. Uh, the abortion is their only way out of that. So to say that they can't have an abortion is to force them to carry that pregnancy. I think the idea of, it, it's a little like saying if you ban theft, you're forcing someone to be poor. Uh, no, no, it's not because uh, this is this is a hollow beyond. This is not just some outside thing that the person has choices to make over. This is something that's, this is a choice that's already made whether they want it to be or not. I'm not sure I follow that, but we can move on. Um, was, were there the any other? Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to comment on Ninetale's question about, you know, women going back into the workforce, because I want to be super clear that like when Kelsey and I talk about how abortion is kind of like a band-aid solution to women's problems. And I was kind of talking about if you look through the history of women entry, you know, the legalization of abortion on a on a nationwide scale here in America um, and the progress of women entering the workforce, it was abortion was offered as a Band-Aid solution to a culture and a society and a workforce that was built for men by men that did not want to adapt to the fact that women can get pregnant. They did not want to adapt their workforce model so that women could be successful while also acknowledging that pregnancy can happen planned, unplanned, and this is a natural biological state that women exist in. So women took a Band-Aid solution that did not actually fix their problems. It gave them you can kill your preborn children and so, that'll make it equal to men. I so when you say, well, go ahead, Hannah. I was just going to say, I think it's a bit of a jump to imply that the only reason that abortion was legalized and that the discussion was happening was because of women entering the workforce. I understand that the two are correlative because we're talking about women getting more autonomy in general in our society. But to say that like people were thinking this and saying like, Oh, well, how are we going to solve the fact that women can get pregnant? Oh, are we going to give them leave? No, let's just have the Supreme Court rule on this and have them allowed to get abortions. Because it's not even something that, like, solved issues. A ton of women who are in the workforce, like, still get pregnant and have the kid and go on maternity leave. Like, there are people who get abortion for socioeconomic reasons. I'm not discounting that. But at the end of the day, it's not all abortions and women who get pregnant and have a job don't all get abortions anyway. So I don't think the two are as linked as you're implying. No, but not today in today's society, because this is just how our culture is. But at the beginning of, you know, you had, 
you had World War II where women were forced to go into the workforce and take the jobs that the men had vacated to go off to war. And then the war ended and women were expected to just go back into their roles. And you had the 1950s where they tried so hard to push the traditional nuclear family. Women stayed home with the children, served their husbands, were expected, you know, to have dinner on the table, kitchen cleaned, house all done up, looking pretty like Martha Stewart. And when by the time the 1960s came and women were fighting to get back out into the workforce and they got they had serious pushback on a societal level. And it was used as an excuse that it's easier to keep men in the workforce because what if a woman gets pregnant? And you did see a huge surge in pregnancy because of the sexual revolution. And corporations use that as an excuse to keep women out of the workforce all throughout the 60s. And you see the correlation, whether it's direct or indirect, of women trying to enter the workforce, being pushed back because of something they biologically could not change about themselves. You have the introduction of birth control and you have the introduction of abortion as options for women so that they could go out into the workforce without the pushback from main sh mainly male dominated corporations and organizations that did not want to hire women. They wanted them at home. I think it's a little confusing considering a lot of people in culture at the time were completely against things like contraception for women. Like it was not like contraception for women came out and everyone was like, yay, people can take the pill now and go to work and not get pregnant. There was huge societal pushback, you know, you had to get like a, 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 a you had to make sure that you were like married half the time in some of these hospitals before you'd even be allowed to like be considered for birth control. Like I, I just, I don't know. I see Roe v. Wade and stuff like that as more part of the larger like second wave feminism of giving women more autonomy, not only over their bodies, but over their lives. So I think they happened at the same time, but I think to imply that it was some like concerted push to push abortion while simultaneously pushing for women in the workforce, I don't think they're related in the way that you're implying. So I, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Kay has said, but I've been searching on, on my phone for this amazing quote and I finally found it. And I think it, I think it sums up what we're trying to convey here. And, it, and it's from uh, Graciela Olivares, uh, who was a Latin American activist in 1972 which would have been the year before Roe v. Wade. And it's, it's part of a, a, a long essay about this, but the, the, the pull quote is, the poor cry out for justice and we respond with legalized abortion. Uh, quite frankly, abortion is cheaper. If, and that is, I think, what's driving a lot of this. Like, abortion has existed all throughout human history, though. It's not specific to the socioeconomic realities of America from the 1960s and to today. Like, it, it's consistently happened in every human society. So to imply that it has some intrinsic connection is just strange to me. I understand that there are socioeconomic factors, but it's not the only factor. There are a myriad of reasons people choose to terminate their pregnancies. So the the evidence that it's gone on throughout history, I, I'm I'm open to seeing more of it. But what I've seen so far is pretty weak, just because you know pre modern societies really did not have the medical means to accomplish abortion. They they simply used infanticide for the same purpose. It really wasn't until the advent of antibiotics that that abortion became safe enough for the mother to be common. I suppose if you're talking about safe medical abortions, sure, but they did exist somewhat in the past. They were just incredibly dangerous. But I get what you're saying. Fair enough. I'm wondering if we could possibly try to move the debate a little bit back to the like the core ethics of abortion, um, unless this like directly relates. I mean, do, do we want to take questions? It sounds like we've, we've had an excellent discussion. Um, I'm, I'm pleased with the discussion we've had. I'm, I'm ready to take questions. I know we got started a little late, so. Um, if you guys want to go ahead and take questions, we can. Is that good with everyone? Sure. 
All right, sounds good. You know what, um, Praise, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and sending over the questions, I'm gonna just go ahead and look through chat and see what I can find in the meantime. Um, here is a question that is coming in. Uh, in socialist countries in Europe, abortion is less common. Nine month maternity leave makes it easy to take on a child. Funny to see socialists arguing this. Thank you, Gabriel, for your $5 super chat. <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, mean, I think that it's interesting that, you know, uh, but we were, we discussed this earlier about, you know, giving resources to women that are in these situations is definitely going to lower the number of abortions that happen. If a woman doesn't want to actually have an abortion, but she's getting an abortion because she's in a horrible situation, she can't find the resources that she needs, getting her those resources and just being a, a support system alongside her throughout her pregnancy or for however long that she needs, of course, is going to lower the number of abortions that happen. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, that, you know, certainly we can have a better safety net for families. And that's not the same as going full socialist, definitely pro-life people run the gamut, uh, as far as the political spectrum is concerned. Hannah Ninetales, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I'm in favor of social safety nets for sure. But at the end of the day, even if abortion rates are lower, there are all sorts of reasons people get abortions other than that. At the end of the day, I still think that it's immoral to stop people from being able to make that choice for themselves because it isn't a definitive finished question of when life begins or what constitutes a human life or if all human life, even if a fetus is human life, is equally... How do I put this? Has equal standing in terms of things like this. I, we keep going back to like, like this whole like, oh, well, it's because of lack of social safety nuts. It's because of people having careers and stuff. And like, sure, that's sort of a proxy thing to talk about. But at the end of the day, there are people who just get abortions because they don't want to get pregnant and don't want to have a kid and don't want to go through the adoption process. And I think that's just as valid. I don't think that the fact that some people do it for other reasons, delegitimizes the reasons that other people get abortions. I'm pro-choice, so if I th if people would have a kid if they were in better socioeconomic places, I agree that they should get that support, but I don't think it changes the fact that people should still have the right to choose for themselves. You Stop. bring up the you bring up what I think is the fundamental question, which is you know how do we know? When, when life is life. I have to disagree with you that it's an open question. And that th this actually comes from my commitment to church-state separation. Because when I look at you know, the, the types of questions that you're bringing up when you're saying, you know, when, when, is, when is a human being really, really real? Um, that question to me really does not seem all that different than asking when a human has a soul. Uh, which I don't think is a question that a government can answer. I think we have to look to objective scientific criteria on life, and that takes us to fertilization. I mean, there's no other point in pregnancy, certain, and certainly the birth canal isn't magic. Uh, the, I mean, the, the science on this is clear, and I, I think actually the best source to look at is abortion doctors themselves. They will be the first to publicly say that abortion is killing a human life. They admit that, they, they justify it, but they admit what's happening. I just want to point out, like you're saying that science has this question answered, but my girlfriend, who's I think even in the chat, is a fourth year PhD candidate in developmental biology. And we were talking about this topic all day. And no, it's not a settled issue. You're talking about a philosophical issue of what constitutes a human being. You can't say like, oh, fertilization, boom, human being. Not necessarily the case. A seed isn't the same thing as a tree. When does it become a tree? I don't know. That's a complicated question. But to say something is a solved scientific issue is just a lie. That is a lie. You can't. That is say absolutely that. not a lie. And with with I, all due respect, it's not a strong word with embryologists and doctors. developmental biology. <laughs> all right. With that one, we can go on to the next one. Um, the next question is from Brandon. How is it ethical to force a woman to carry to term and also to throw the child into a foster care system where abuse and negligence is rampant? 
I can take that one. So first of all, foster care reform absolutely needed. It's actually one of the um, things that S Students for Life just recently put out like this six point blueprint uh, for pro-life priorities going forward and that is one of them. Uh, however, thankfully, when a woman chooses life and winds up placing that child for adoption, the foster care system is not a necessary component uh, when some Talking ideals and say like, yes, ideally, they wouldn't go into the foster care system. And we're trying to make improvements who get put up for adoption do end up in the foster care system. They just to give birth to an infant who will be put up for adoption. Foster care is not going to be involved because that children are usually older, very rare for an infant to be in foster care. They are usually older. And most cases, they are not pursuing adoption. They're pursuing family reunification. Instead, presumably these kids end up, instead of what we consider the foster care system, they go to some other government orphanage type situation. No, they, they, go, to, they go to adoptive families. That's I not mean, necessarily better. Like you can't necessarily ensure that those families are gonna be great. So well, that's just the, the great thing about better. our adoptive system, the great thing about our adoption system as opposed to the foster care system is unfortunately the foster care system is government run. And like we see for the most part, it's horribly run because the government runs it. Um, the adoption system is privatized. These are private organizations that are dealing with the adoption process. So there is, there's actually no government involvement there. These are private organizations that take care of it. Except, well, no, except that you do have to go, you, you do have to go through a home, um, you, you do have to have your home investigated if you want to be an adoptive parent. Right. All right. That is a requirement. That is a state requirement. With that one, we are going to go on to the next question. We have one from Layman. He says, how does everyone feel about federalized free birth control, condoms, birth control pills, and emergency contraceptives <laughs> as funded by taxes? Yeah, I mean, we, we have that here in the United States. I would imagine that we have it in Canada as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm all for contraception. Yeah. Wonderful. Agree. Sounds like yes. a <laughs> universal agreement. That's awesome. Um, I mean, if we're going to pay taxes, it might as well go to something like free contraception. <laughs> <laughs> next one is from um, Gabriel K. He says, we are living in an aging society. Abortion is dismantling our social fabric. Spend money on support. Do it. If anyone wants a comment, you can. Uh, yeah, I'll just say real quick, it's inc like if if abortion is dismantling your social fabric, you might want to reevaluate what that fabric is made out of. All right. Next next um, comment or question is from Sunflower. Thank you so much. Um, they say, Hannah, to play off your firefighter thought experiment, if we change it into a bucket of sperm versus a single embryo in an incubator, which one do you? It's a college male you, dorm. Come on. Very, very, very disturbed. You have not spent <laughs> enough time on the internet. Then. Don't have sex. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't get on board with that. I mean, I. F first of all, I I don't agree with the phrase "potential life" uh, with with respect to life that has already been conceived. Um, I, I reserve that phrase "potential life" for you know thinking about like you know generations in the future in an abstract way. Um, but there, yes, yeah, so certainly, uh, I, I think that we can have uh, both a, a, a culture where women can have sex. Um, if anyone wants to to say anything else, you can. Yeah, I would just point out too that like condemning somebody to that reality, it's, it doesn't, I don't think the morality of that issue applies the way they think it does. All right, the next one is from Jay Shai. Um, he says, would it be okay to donate my organs and then change my mind and rip them out, causing you to die? The uterus's purpose is to be a home. If I own my house, I can't murder someone I invited. Well, I think the comparison to someone getting unintentionally as the same as inviting someone falls a little too close to being like, you fornicated, deal with the consequences, which I find to be a ridiculous argument. So I don't know. 
Yeah. I, I mean, the, the first part of ha- that, when you're talking about organ donation, that I find more valid. I mean, the, 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 the analogy of pregnancy to organ donation is one that's been made pretty frequently, but you know, when, w- once an organ donation has occurred, you can't kill the donee to get your kidney back. Uh, so so I, I agree with the first half. But I, I don't. Here too. Go Sorry, ahead. one quick comment. You volunteer to give someone an organ, though. You fill out tons of paperwork and you consent to do so. The same doesn't exist for pregnancy. Anyway, sorry. Okay, well, I mean, you, you could tweak the, the thought experiment a bit and say, you know, you've, you've, you're in the hospital for something else and there's a terrible mix-up. Uh, but, but as I said before, I don't think we need to resort to thought experiments. I, I think the, the real-life example of conjoined twins is better. My All problem right. with that, uh, if I could just quickly say something as well, is that uh, when you're donating an organ, you're never giving away something you either can't get back or that without it you can't function. Uh, unless you're already dead. So uh, there's not really a lot of like consequence that would justify doing that, that like what you could theoretically apply to abortion. All right. The next one is from Jay Shy again, says it's like throwing your toddler off the boat you own because you have power and rights over the boat and can't wait till save Till safe land to deliver it. No, it isn't. <laughs> no. I think I think the problem there, and, and not even necessarily problem, because like I said, I think this is not a black and white issue. And people who like view uh, fetuses as human life, I understand where you're coming from. But that's why I'm pro-choice. If that's how you view it. That's perfectly fine, but that's not how other people view it. The fact that we're even here having this debate proves it's not a black and white issue. Like, modern day debates doesn't have debates. It's like, is it okay to stab homeless people in the face 17 times? Because we all agree that's not okay. But the fact that we're here says it's a complicated issue without a definitive answer. So, Hannah, let let me build on that. Um, If... If the pro-life movement is culturally successful, you know, if you if you fast forward two generations yeah. and there is broad agreement in the United States and there's only a minority in support of abortion, in, in your view, how, what, what, and I, I, you don't have to say an exact number necessarily, yeah. but like, at what point do you say, okay, uh, you know, support for abortion is such a minority view it's okay to impose the pro-life view in law? Or do you think there's never such a point? That's a good point. And I don't know if you're going to like my answer because I'm not even necessarily, I I morally disagree, but that's always how society has functioned. We mentioned earlier in the debate, someone did about previous societies using like infanticide regularly. Mm -hmm. Obviously we all here agree that that's wrong, but the goalpost says to what is moral move consistently with society. So if 200 years from now, a thousand years from now, human beings still exist and everyone Mm -hmm. agrees like, Hey, uh, uh, fetuses, they're the same as human beings. Then they're going to see me as wrong. And that's how it works. Society is always trying to figure out their zeitgeist and where those moral goalposts are. So I don't know. That's always what we do in society is decide, okay, enough of us agree this is not okay. This is now illegal. Right. So my my question is, what is enough? Oh, I don't know. That's a complicated question. I don't know a specific number, but I recognize that as a society and how society functions, if the majority of people decided that it was abhorrent and should be illegal, it would be. I wouldn't necessarily morally agree. But again, that's why we're here talking about it. It's a debate. Right. And I just, I just really wanted to respond to the boat thing. Um, the boats don't have autonomous rights, and so killing for the sake of the boat because you're the owner. I don't doesn't think that's act- what they were saying. Um, well, I, you have power and I, rights I, over the boat. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not. It's even more detached from reality. Holy cow! Yeah, I, I think they're trying to. I, I think they're trying to analogize, like to to treat bodily autonomy right as a as a species of property right i think that's where that's coming from all right let's go on to the next one from retro should it not be the responsibility of those who never want to have children to have a vasectomy or tubal ligation 
uh, maybe in a world where it's free and there's hardly any risk of complications, uh, they can do that. But I, I wouldn't say it's their responsibility because um, people generally, again, aren't doing things just to prevent children. Uh, it's like having sex isn't just being done to have children. So it's for someone it, like you're bordering the argument that in order to have sex, you got to have these things. Otherwise, you're responsible for the child. But again, the responsibility is on the biology of that person. It's not a conscious decision of that person to have a child. So even if they do have those things available, they're not responsible. It would just be better if they could do those things safely and uh, cheaply. The one problem that we woman has already had children. Uh, and their reasons are basically fear of being sued for malpractice if she regrets the tubal ligation. Uh, women can regret abortions, we'll still do those, but oh my goodness, she might regret the tubal ligation, so I don't want to do it. Uh, and I think that could be a point of common ground where we try to, to beat that back and make tubal ligation more accessible. Okay, I might be a little mistaken. Are these reversible? I thought that this was this a contraception based procedures for men and women, the, the how they work very different, uh, very greatly. For women, it's almost always more invasive. And so uh, I'm pretty sure that puts a much greater burden on five weeks, therefore technically are not alive, um, brain dead. How can you kill something that is technically not alive? Where does the worth arise? That's like 15. <laughs> <laughs> Getting their um, money's worth. <laughs> I mean, I, I can start with the first one, which is that I'm, I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in a soul. I'm, I'm not going to find soul for you. Uh, I think using consciousness as the many situations where someone I am not a doctor. I don't proclaim to be a medic. These super intense, complicated, pre-delivering them, deliver them alive, give them their best chance at life. Um, I just... Oh! <laughs> Was that me? I'm sorry. Getting excited. Getting, excited. getting a little riled up here. I had an they wanted to give you a theme song. <laughs> Could I, uh, were you done, Kay? Could I enter this? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Also? Okay, yeah, so um, I'm gonna, I had an answer. Uh, so yeah, so basically if you wanna have like socioeconomics be a solution to abortion, that's not a reason to stop providing abortion. That's a reason to solve those socioeconomic problems and others before you start making abortion illegal. So that question doesn't really, I think, pertain to like current abortion ethics. Gotcha. If I can get back to the the, the rape aspect of the question. Uh, so se Secular Pro-Life as an organization, we, we have members who support the rape exception and we have mem members who don't. And we just kind of, we work together because rape accounts for such a small percentage of abortions that we, you know, we might as well work together on preventing the, you know, the, the vast majority of them and, and make that our focus. Um, but the, the two problems that I have, and, you know, and I, I struggle with it, but the, the two problems I have with the rape exception are, are one that I know people who were conceived in the rape. And I do not want to do or say or believe anything that undermines their humanity and their dignity. Uh, and I know they find the rape exception very offensive. Um, and the second thing is that if you, if you say, you know, I, you know, I oppose abortion except in cases of rape, that can very easily be twisted or can sound like or be, um, become, you know, I, I believe in uh, the right to life for most for uh you know those cases where women shamefully opened their legs but if she didn't then an abortion is like that that to me is weird even though we disagree i want to say i appreciate the kiss consistency from you too because it kind of annoys me when some pro-life people are like well in these cases it's fine well if you're arguing that it's life and it's has you know all these rights then it shouldn't matter the circumstances i don't know i appreciate the consistency i just want to say that Thank you. Um, next question is from Gabriel. He says, cutting up a fetus and pulling out legs, comma, arms, okay, question mark? 
no. <laughs> I well, think that's what I mean, the, it's, debate, oh, the whole it's, debate was about. <laughs> it's better than leaving a dead fetus in there. Mm -hmm. so. Next, next um, question comes from John Maddox. Again, if um, don't feel the necessity to answer these questions, if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, he says, um, do all four debaters have a uterus? If no, are you arguing as a, as potential mothers? Um, I think he's, he might be referencing adoption. Also epic after show on Nicholas Proclaimer of Messiah channel, Jack Burton lots, whatever that means. <laughs> um, <laughs> interesting commenters tonight. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I know Kay has already spoken to uh, giving birth twice, uh, so safe assumption she has a uterus. Uh, I also have a uterus. Mm -hmm. I have not been pregnant. I um, simply uh, have not had a romantic relationship go that way, and I expect to become a mother through adoption eventually. Um, I do not have a uterus. I'm trans, as much as the chat has pointed out so lovely, lovely, but... Uh, uh, I, 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 I thought about this a lot before I came on this debate and I'm like, do I even, why would, why, why would I have a perspective on this? I would say that if I were coming from the pro-life side or if I was like saying everyone should get abortions, I get that. But all I'm trying to argue for is that people who have the capability to get pregnant should have the right to choose for themselves. I'm not trying to dictate anything to anyone. So I don't see my ability to become pregnant as a factor in this, but yeah, yeah and I, I actually agree. I mean, I, I, I think the, the whole no uterus, no opinion thing is ridiculous and that everyone, cis or trans, male or female, whatever, whatever parts you got shouldn't matter. It's your ideas should matter. Well, exactly. And like, personally, I'm just compassionate towards expecting our mothers or pe people who want to eventually have children. Uh, personally, even though uh, I could adopt, I just personally, I don't want to be a parent. And considering what I know about myself, I feel awful knowing that uh, someone has to deal with raising a child under the conditions that I experience, knowing that they aren't going to be a fit parent, or they're going to have to put that child into the, the chaotic void of you know, who, who's going to be the foster parents, which, uh, or not foster parents, but adoptive parents and stuff like that. I just think that it's easier for that, for someone who would be in my position and does have a uterus, uh, psychologically speaking, to just not have a child. Gotcha. Well, thank you all for coming on the show and for taking the time out of your busy schedule. <laughs> oh, no. I, I saw that one. <laughs> I think it was a little, I don't know. We'll say it, silly. but if anyone wants to like jump on it, go for it. Um, again, from Gabriel, he says, dead fetus, question mark. So it was alive before abortion. I don't think the question yes. is necessarily living or dead. Like the hamburger I ate yesterday was alive, but I'm not a vegetarian. You know what I mean? I think it's more about personhood. The discussion of personhood and the responsibilities and rights we place upon that concept. So I think it's reasonable to say living fetus. I think we recognize like it has cells that are dividing and it's growing and those things that are qualities of life. I just don't necessarily consider a fetus like, like a person or at least not morally a person the same way that I would see like any person walking down the street or any person that I recognize as a person. Also, from the perspective of developmental biology, there is definitely a point where the, the fetus doesn't feel pain, doesn't have a conscious experience. And so you could say that even like alive or dead, there's not going to be any difference to the fetus that when that happens. I, I, I can acknowledge that it's different after the developmental point. Uh, but, you know, there's definitely a, a, a point at first where whether or not you're ripping it apart doesn't matter. I mean, obviously, I disagree, but I think the only things I have to say to that would be rehashing prior things, and I know that we're uh, <laughs> eager to get to sleep because I'm I'm an old fart and it's past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I reiterate, thank you all for taking your time away from sleep and other obligations to come <laughs> on here. Um, and also, chat, thank you for being patient with us while we were struggling with some technical issues. I'm glad that it all came together and that and um, I feel like this was a really good time and um, keep um, 
uh, separating the reasonable from the unreasonable, as James would say. <laughs> um, if you guys want to go ahead and, um, and say goodbye, we'll call it a night. It was a pleasure to meet all of you. Oh, you too. Yeah. I'm just going to plug my stuff. Um, I'm Nine Tails Cosmic Fox. I have Instagram. I have uh, YouTube. My Twitter is at letter M, the number nine, and then Scarlet with two Ts. Uh, follow my Twitter for a more personal side and my Instagram for cute cats. <laughs> and thank you to my uh, fellow debaters. Uh, you can find Secular Pro-Life on all the usual social media channels. And thank you all. Everyone's link should be in the bio. Um, and hopefully, and so that will make it nice and easy to go and find all these wonderful people. Um, but thank you 